Okay, so, yeah, back at it again. Um, yeah, we're here, this is Ian McMillan, um, cinematographer from Toronto. Uh, you came from Halifax, though, right? Yeah, uh, I'm originally from Halifax. I lived in Halifax till I was about 19. 19, I moved to Montreal to go to Concordia University in film production program there, and I stayed in Montreal till about 2012, and then I moved to Toronto after that. And you started out directly as a DP, or you started out doing camera assisting, or...? No, I started as a camera assistant. Yeah. Um, I started... Uh, there's a great community in Halifax um, at uh, the Atlantic Filmmakers Cooperative, and when I was a teenager in high school, uh, a friend and I kind of went and started looking at some workshops there. Not really with too many grandiose expectations, but just curiosity, really, and ended up really falling in love with the camera as a tool, as a box, you know, and just how it kind of got into it. Started taking all these workshops and started assisting for one of the teachers of the workshops who uh, became a mentor of mine, um, Tarek Abulaman. And so we started working when I was about 16 on a lot of indie shorts and music videos. Uh, still shooting on film at the time, which is really cool. So shooting with like SR3, Movie Cam Super America, uh, 535, 435, Aerie 3. And a lot of fun with that and like loading and yeah, working with a bunch of different filmmakers in Halifax. Some that I still get to see today, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and then after about like three years, I guess I decided to uh, kind of move, move west a bit, go to Montreal. I had been to Montreal like as a teenager and just always enjoyed my time there and thought it would be a really creative city to go to. And yeah, didn't pan the out there? Did you? Ah, didn't pan out? Uh, well, I mean, in the long run, I suppose. I haven't worked in Montreal in a while, but I, it did pan out in that I met a lot of really great people, people that I still love dearly and work with uh, when I can. Uh, my good friend Olivier Le Monte Le Moine, he and I had made a lot of projects together while I was in Montreal. Uh, and my good friend Stefan Grasso made a lot of projects together in Montreal. And I also met uh, Bobby Shore, Kieran Crilly, and a lot of other great filmmakers that I ended up working with uh, as an electric and a gaffer and just people that I kind of started in having in my community in Montreal before coming here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think you mentioned, I remember when you first came to Toronto mm -hmm. and you were trying to get a lot of work and one of the first things you started doing is, was music videos and since then mm -hmm. I remember you telling me about that, um, just taking on any and every music video you could just to get your feet like <laughs> Kind of, yeah. Uh, well, it's actually almost more like further down the line as far as what I did in Toronto. When I came here first, I was shooting Doc and I kind of started from a documentary standpoint. Uh, so I started doing doc series. I ended up shooting on a series called Cold Water Cowboys for Discovery, uh, which we like lived on a fishing boat for four months and it was quite, quite the experience out in Newfoundland. Um, did another doc series called Illusions of Grandeur for City TV and Rogers. That was great. We toured the states and a couple cities in Canada with a magician and got to see a lot of stuff, got to really build a a look for a documentary series that wasn't just kind of pedestrian in my mind. We wanted something that was a little bit more kind of grandiose feeling and that was fun. But uh, slowly but surely kind of building fiction contacts and music video contacts throughout that time. And so I'd say like the last three years I kind of jumped into the music video game to try to play with different ideas, play with different styles meet a bunch of different directors and just yeah. play around with some, some crazy stuff. Yeah, at some point we'll do a, a thing where we look at some of the music yeah. you've done because like, every time I look at something that you've done, it's always you've always done something different in a creative level on each one of those. And I know the recent uh, film you were working on, um, you're playing with the CRLS that lighting system. Yeah. And yeah. like just I can, you can see there's a different approach to some of the lighting that you've done. This mm -hmm. is not as, as typical or standard. Totally. Totally. Um, I mean, one of the great things I love about music videos is that it integrates itself so well with stage lighting 
and I kind of have an ace in the hole that my brother is a lighting director for stage. And so every once in a while, I get the chance to bring Duncan out. And he's such an incredible board tech. And also, he's a, he's a drummer. He was a, a professional drummer and has, has a degree in drumming. So he's such a rhythmic-minded person. And we can build like these really cool lighting setups together for music videos with LED stage lighting and stuff that you know, needs a little bit more board control and DMX control. Well, even that Just magician show that you did, uh, yeah. that was all like one location with DMX. I remember you were setting all stuff up in there, and you had like mm -hmm. so many different looks, but you didn't have to, to worry about like going and changing the positions of any of the lights at all because mm -hmm. you you had him on the board, and it was all yeah, yeah. That was a show called Houdini and Doyle, not uh, Illusions of Grandeur, but that was similar where we just built a big truss set up over top of uh, a church, and then this um, kind of old abandoned warehouse, and. Uh, we would just have everything built in and Duncan would just plug and play based on our look so we were able to get through two different episodes a day yeah. with a completely different look on each episode. And I mean on, on a side note which was probably might be interesting for people is, is the fact that some of the staging equipment when you're on a tighter budget can also be... Oh yeah, well, it's, a, it's a way to save a little bit of money. It's kind of... It, it, with, I mean <laughs> to stay on the music video subject for a second uh, there's always, your budget is never big enough and your idea is always too big. It's always kind of the, the like lesson for music videos across the board. So you could kind of try to find where you can save a little bit of money, where you can like shuffle it around. And one of the great thing with stage houses is that piping, sandbags, uh, par cans, source fours, and little LEDs, like color blasts and stuff like that are dirt cheap. And so you can get a lot of your kind of base level of lighting dealt with and then get your grip from a rental house, film rental house. And that's usually on the cheaper end of the spectrum as well. So you kind of balance it out with stage lighting to do your keys and grip from the yeah. grip from whites of PS. So smart moves around that. Um, yeah. So let's let's actually get into some of these. Yeah. We want to keep this a little short if we can. Totally. So, um, the film we're looking at right now here, which is... Yeah, so I wanted to talk about two shorts. We'll see how far we get with both of them. Uh, the first that we're looking at right now, this is a short called The Things You Think I'm Thinking, which is directed by uh, a dear friend and uh, consistent collaborator, Sharon Lee. Uh, we've made a bunch of projects together, and I love working with her. And this one was cool uh, for us because oftentimes she's got a very handheld and loose and free style. And this one she wanted to be as locked down as possible. We were going to be on Dolly. Uh, we were using a larger camera system than usual. We usually like a mirror or a mini, something small. But on this one we were on the SXT with Cook Anamorphics. So it was a beast of a camera. Yeah, so for the people, if they don't know the SXT, yeah. that's the... It's the larger, newer model of the Alexa Classic. Um, and yeah, just a and, larger and, camera. And the, the recorder system on it? Yeah, we were recording to Codex on it. So. And so a new card system too, which kind of created its own set of challenges yeah. for as well. So for people who are trying to shoot on Alexa and mm -hmm. they can't afford um, a different model of an Alexa camera, that's an option for them because it doesn't go out as often? Yeah, I mean that's what we found. We kind of lucked out. Um, William F. White, uh, was really, really generous with us from a camera standpoint on that show that the, sh the camera just wasn't being used, so we got an incredible deal on it. Um, and I think it's because it's a little bit less used right now. People are still getting used to the SXT and also the size of the SXT that it might be available a little bit more often. Yeah. <laughs> but we just lucked out in that weekend that we had this you know, two-day shoot and it was like, that's on the shelf, okay, great. Uh, Cook Anamorphics on the shelf, okay, cool. We can build a package out of this that will, you know, get us to where we want to be. I think a lot of the times with short films, you're always, much like music videos, your budget's relatively limited unless you're, you know, on that diamond in the rough short yeah. that has a big budget. But it, uh, you kind of work with what you have and hope that it checks off, checks off the bases, I guess, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, it's, it's a good point, too, is that some of the rental houses, like, people, oftentimes people are afraid to go and ask 
if these cameras are available because they're just afraid the rates are going to be way too high and they can't exactly. afford it. But um, they have been quite supportive. Of totally. And I think it's more of the idea, like, why leave it on the shelf? I think if you, if you have a relationship with a rental house that's positive and you've proven yourself to the rental house as being someone that's respectful to the gear and, and respectful of the process and you want to have that relationship, then I think most rental houses are pretty amenable to the idea of helping somebody out. I think, you know, nobody, we're all in the business of, you know, telling stories and I think most people want to give that opportunity to people. So I think, you know, fostering a relationship with rental houses is so important, not just for the quality of the people, but just, you know, to help you tell your stories the way that, way that you want to, or the best way possible. So this one was shot, uh, the SXT on Cook Anamorphics. Yep. Yep, so the look that you have here. Yeah, so we started, um, we, the, the shoot was in two locations. The look that we have here is starting the film. Uh, we got, um, it starts the film to introduce this character, Prince, who's uh, seated on the couch here. But at the start of the shot, it's a steady cam shot that kind of wraps around an apartment. And it starts with birthday cake. So you don't really know what the character is necessarily. Let's turn the volume yeah. off a little bit. Yeah. <coughs> I'm just trying to kind of figure out what's going on at the top of the film. You know, it's his birthday or someone's birthday. And wraps around to reveal our character. Uh, and our lead character is uh, Prince Sampusa, who um, is a fantastic actor. Uh, I'll stop it there. That's kind of our transition into his, his character. He's a fantastic actor. Um, the script kind of uh, was written by Jesse Lavercombe, who will be his kind of uh, the, the co-lead of the film. But it, it follows uh, Prince in a fictionalized version of uh, kind of a telling of, you know, going through some of the difficulties in his own life, and, uh, but fictionalized and told in another story, just to kind of open up, you know, a window on a world. And uh, these are some of the challenges that he lives with on a daily basis, and he was really, really incredible to allow us as a crew and as a team to come and share a bit of his story, though fictionalized, with uh, you know, with the world and with us. So, so then with this story, <clears throat> when you were talking with the director about the way the camera is going to be moving for the mm -hmm. story, um, where did you land, and, and what, why did you land in this, this style? Uh, Wait, Murray has things to say. All right. Um, I think that because. Um, we wanted it to feel clean. We wanted it to feel safe in the way that it was moving. And as the story progresses, it kind of shows him trying to uh, find comfort with someone who could, you know, possibly break down some of his walls or, or offer him <coughs> vulnerability. <laughs> <Hi>. Mary. <coughs> the wild card. <laughs> All right, Mary. You got it. Mary! Um, so, if you're telling the story about someone who's trying to break down their walls and trying to, um, you know, get rid of some of their vulnerability, I think it's, it's easy to say, let's be handheld, let's be loose, let's be chaotic. Make it feel real. Cause, yeah, because someone's <laughs> trying to break down my walls, I need my walls up, right? But I think that if you involve the camera too much at that point, then you're taking away from trying to get to know the actor and get to know the characters. Uh, Sharon and I often, our styles will be, like I said, handheld and a little bit loose or handheld on a dolly so that there's like a degree of movement to it but still kind of has that looseness. But I think we felt that it would take away ultimately from just trying to tell a human story in this, in this regard. Mm -hmm. There is one scene that is handheld and it's kind of when they come at each other in, in the kitchen uh, in an argument near the end of the film. But that made a little bit more sense to us because at that point the vulnerability was there yeah. and the walls were coming down. 
Uh, did you change any of the choices in the lenses that you use to help tell it? Like whether, whether it means like longer lenses to feel further away or, mm -hmm. or wider lenses to feel in there. Was there any selections mm -hmm. on, on that side of it? Generally, we are longer. Uh, that steady cam shot is on a 65 mil and it doesn't really feel it, but we were in a bigger space. So uh, we wanted to kind of get back and go a little bit longer for a bit more compression. Um, we didn't want to be wide and in people's faces just because, you know, with anamorphic, it starts to distort a little bit more quickly. And again, that wasn't part of the story that we were trying to tell. We weren't trying to, you know, make people look you know, un, not realistic or mm -hmm. we wanted to have it as kind of a, a neutral representation of what could be kind of a, a difficult situation, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, and I guess there's something to note too if people don't realize it as well, 65 mil in anamorphic is equivalent to 135? Uh, on 35, I mean, it's 65 mil vertical about like 40. Yeah, so like if you're shooting 35, so, you're yeah. like 40 mil. Yeah. Um, so it's not so far off as far as compression, but yeah. we didn't want to be on like a 40 mil anamorphic or... Because a 40 mil anamorphic like would feel like... Yeah, closer to like a 30 or... Yeah, something... 28, on a horizontal. Yeah, know. yeah. Um, and yeah, we didn't... We... Which is good, because when I watch the film, you don't feel like you are in the person's personal space. No. You never feel like you're in their bubble and like in there. It's like... As so. So as a viewer, I didn't find it uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Though the situation could be uncomfortable, you didn't mm -hmm. feel like you were a third person standing there in that conversation. No, and I, I think that part of that too comes from just the idea that, you know, why allow someone to be in a vulnerable space? Because this character this is just not willing to share that part of themselves. And there's multiple times over and over and over that he just stops vulnerability from happening. And so I don't think it necessarily deserved to be like, show me what you're going to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I think it was, it was a kind of a nicer choice to be back and, and yeah. watching it from a distance. Yeah, to a certain extent. it felt right. Yeah. Um, is there anything, any frames that you want to pull up that you'd like to speak about uh, offhand? As far yeah, as, as far I as mean, as this one, for example, which is the, the first time we like really get to kind of sit with Prince in, uh, in a calm setting. The birthday is so... Uh, joyous and everybody's having such a good time and you don't really get to see any now it's like let's tell the story about the character that we have so here we're on a much longer lens I think this is 100 something about that to be honest I'm not I don't yeah. recollect exactly but we wanted to get everything nice and compressed and the use of the mirror too is just to you know just add a little bit more of you know anxiety to the frame I guess because now he's on his own I think most people that are uncomfortable with the situation that they're in are most comfortable in a, like a social environment. And as soon as you have to come back and deal with yourself, that's when you know you start to break down or you start to doubt yourself or right. things like that. And this, um, we shot mostly at night, and so this we, we added our blue kind of daylight push from the side, a couple of big eight eyes with some daylight kinos going through it just to add a little bit of that. And his skin is so nice and reflective that it kind of picks into, picks up the different tones. Yeah, yeah. Um, going through the film, the, the scene after this, so he has this scene at the house, and we go through to this bar. So we shot this at Cold Tea. This is where we introduce Jesse, and Jesse is a fair-skinned uh, white boy in comparison to Prince's dark skin, and so that's where we kind of started getting into the challenge of lighting these two characters in the same scene, because they were about to um, spend a lot of time together for the rest of the movie. So um, oftentimes in any shot with Jesse and with Prince, uh, there is an additional light above the frame for Prince. And Sharon is, uh, Sharon loves to let performance go. She loves to leave it open for performance and uh, to let them kind of get to wherever they need to get to as far as positions in the scene. This scene works out great that they're both sitting on stools so I can <laughs> get in and, and add something where I need to add something. But in the uh, preceding scenes or 
the scenes after this. Um, that's not so much the case. We wanted to let the, the floor open up completely. Mm -hmm. And it opened up a few challenges from time to time as far as making sure that our dark skin and light skin characters didn't get into an environment where they were underlit or overlit based on where they decided to land in the room. Yeah, I know some people approach when you have two different tones of skin tone, uh, they'll either let the darker skin tone fall away and let it be how it is, mm -hmm. and then some other people, their approach is to bring up darker skin to match or try and, mm -hmm. so it doesn't completely fade away. Mm -hmm. Um, and your approach on this was? On, on this one, uh, I wanted to try to just get it, oftentimes I'll kind of let it live in the space and if it needs an extra thing, I'll try to add it where I can. But in, in this case, I did overlight the space, I would say. Just in the interest more of, of just having a, a, a deeper black, like having more information in the, in the black in general. Mm -hmm. So that if I needed to raise it up, I could. So I would say that Jesse, most of the time, is a little bit higher than than where Prince landed. Yeah. But I also don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want that to always dictate how you light a scene because I think you want people to come in and out of darkness as well. You want that kind of mood. Yeah. And uh, Prince actually has a few different textures of skin. Uh, like a, the, a little bit lighter near the top of his head and darker in his cheek. And so there was a little bit of play that you had to do with that too. And uh, just to um, make sure that you weren't like top lighting the scene completely because then you kind of need to get in from a side light as well to allow for that. Did you find that when you came to your grading session, uh, where did you grade this as well? Uh, we graded this at Alter Ego with Connor Fitchman. Okay, great. And uh, when you guys worked together on this, did you find you were doing a lot of painting in the pro side with windows, or was most of it locked mm, in? No, most of it was locked in. I'd say where we really kind of went in and started to play was in, um, in the kitchen near the walls. So this is where it got difficult, because <laughs> you know, to add to the fact that we're two very, very different skin tones, we're also playing in a white room. Yeah, white walls on top of it all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah. Uh, you have another character, which is the apartment, which is the most pale person you've ever met. So, <laughs> and, uh, and so there was a lot of, we, we tried to put a lot of control in here and like put like the, this is, the, the apartment has about 14 foot ceiling and we kind of built our grid on top of the apartment mm -hmm. and kind of lined it with blacks and tried to tease as much off the walls as we could. But you can't always get away with everything, especially in a you know a shot like this, for example, that we're looking at right now, where they're both pressed up against the wall. So we did add a fair amount of shading to the sides of the image in post, just to help direct the eye, yeah. just to kind of say, you know, stop looking at the corners of the wall. <laughs> uh, and that and as Sharon would call my nemesis on this film, was a white fridge. Yeah. And this white fridge, uh, at least in post, we, we took it way, way down in post, but it was hard to have an active play area in the center of the room with a giant white box in, in front of it. So, and we also didn't want to clutter it with things because it just didn't seem like it would necessarily be Prince's character's uh, style to yeah, clutter like, it with yeah, things. Yeah, you look at the sets, like there's nothing on the fridge. The only thing that really speaks is an item that tells a bit of, about him is, is the hanging camera that's there. Yeah, yeah well, the, I mean, from a set dressing standpoint, Sharon and I notice a lot because Prince is, is missing uh, uh, his forearms on both arms, or, or at least part of his uh, arms. Um, there's a lot of set dressing that actually speaks to having dexterous hands. Mm -hmm. There's like a statue of a hand next to his bed. There's an uh, old camera. There's, if, if we were to go through the film, I could point out all the little things, but we, we kept noticing that there was a lot of kind of harking back to a memory of before an accident or before a very nostalgic kind of situation, which would make him that much more reluctant to be vulnerable because he's always remembering that there's there's a thing that he's not capable of, and that is what he thinks to be his 
his, uh, you know, his downfall or the reason why he can't connect. Mm -hmm. um, if we were looking at the film too, is there any um, any other technical concerns or considerations that you had that came up when you were working with you look with those, the, the cook anamorphics? Yeah, I mean the biggest thing was just the size of the body. Camera body with the everything. camera body. Yeah. Uh, when we were on steady uh, doing the 65 mil, which is the largest of the cook set, our operator Liam Ward he was taxed out for his weight clearance on his steady off on his on his sled. Um, <clears throat> and so he, he you know it was a tough it was a tough go because it's like right on the edge of what that thing could take. Um, also, I did the handheld sequence, and so um, I had to steal that. Uh, sound blanket belt that Catherine Luce does, I had to steal that idea <laughs> and just shove my elbows into the sound blanket and just like support this behemoth of a camera on my shoulder. Um, otherwise, we were on Pee-wee for almost everything. Uh, we were always on Dolly, whether it was just like for a little move. The film is always in a slight amount of movement. Mm -hmm. um, so not too difficult. Also, the apartment, the way that we shoot it, we make it look like it's 10 feet wide when really it's 20 feet wide. You never see that back half of the apartment, and we kind of play it like it doesn't exist, but it kind of mirrors itself behind the camera. So there's quite a bit of area there. Mm -hmm. And so we have, you know, a couple of book lights built on the floor. But in the sky, there's, you know, three pancakes, uh, with 1K bulbs dimmed down. Everything is, is a really a large bulb dimmed down to about 25-30%. Mm -hmm. And then we'd pull a little bit of that warmth out in post. Right, so this practical that's playing right here, that's not letting your scene at all. It's just that's not doing right anything, right. yeah. And if you look carefully <laughs> at it, there's a piece of um, uh, tin foil behind the bulb. I do that a lot with practical bulbs if I don't want them to actually affect the set, but still glow bright enough and not look like they're dimmed down and mm. kind of mute, is I'll put a piece of tin foil behind the bulb that flags it from lighting anything. And oftentimes you can get away with it because it just looks like a bright blob and nobody looks at it. This one. Yeah. And if you were to use black wrap instead of tin foil? It doesn't reflect as much, right? It doesn't blow out. Yeah. And if you're going to see a bulb, it can blow out. Yeah. It's better that it blows out than it looks like a piece of black wrap. Anyway. Yeah, it doesn't do any crazy flare-wise as far as uh, no. on those lenses. I mean, the cooks are really soft. Yeah. Right? They're really soft. It's a difficult lens to know if you have it in focus or not. And kudos to our focus puller on this, Josh McDonald. He, uh, Josh, great. Yeah, solid. Uh, solid DP, too. Um, he, he kind of, he had already done, a, like... I think at least two of the projects I've done with Sharon, and he kind of knew that they're just going to be like performing and, and landing on whatever mark they need to mark on. So Josh is, I don't even know if he's still pulling focus, but he's rock solid. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll get him on. One time. Yeah, we'll get him on one, one more time, Josh. Uh, so is there anything else you want to speak about on this project before we quickly jump into Spartan Into Jordan? the other one. Um, and we let, we let shots go, and, and shots live for you know, a solid minute, two minutes, um, just to really let it live and let it, let it, let it, you know, be human and not get too cutty. Yeah, that was a nice thing of watching the pace of it. Yeah. You feel like you're being forced to follow anything. You can kind of just explore the scene and it just played itself out. Exactly. And oftentimes, uh, and Sharon does this a lot too, is she'll just like let a shot turn into another shot, let it turn into another value, move, move around a little bit. Originally, the daylight scene that we did was one big oneer that went for probably about a minute and a half before the bar scene, but it just ended up getting cut up because it was taking too much time. So it instead of it starts here, and we dolly back, we S curve back actually, and then come all the way back through the apartment, but it gets cut up. But like I say, she let and so we cut up that entire piece of him walking back to his bed but it works perfectly as is and it feels like we've covered it that way yeah but you don't need to see all that you don't need to see all that yeah. but it's also like from a lighting standpoint you build all that you allow that to live yeah. so that you can kind of shoot whatever you want and I think with a performance director like Sharon that's the goal right is that I want to be able to turn the camera 
to 99% of things. Yeah. <laughs> if I yeah. can hide yeah. everything in one place or in the ceiling or something, then I know that she'll have the opportunity to let the actors do whatever they want to do. And that's a freedom that she likes to have. Yeah. And, and uh, other than that, yeah, uh, really another example of the performance take is the, the end of the film where they're sitting together on the couch is another just two minute long shot. And at this point, they've kind of, you know, admitted a few things to each other about themselves and, and coming clean a bit and a little embarrassed and a little nervous. And not, we're not sure where this relationship is going to go, but we feel like something positive is going to happen. But still, we shoot them from behind. We don't really see you their expressions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesse, who's just kind of admitted a little bit of his own weakness, is backlit. And uh, Prince, who's definitely put in the spotlight in this situation, is hard and front lit. And then the camera just kind of dollies back, and we we just assume that something something good might come of this. Yeah. Not giving away too much of the film, though. Right. <laughs> Trying my best. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's stop it there. Um, and then